So good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending the second online lecture, public lecture of the Amsterdam Troy project. I hope you can hear me very well. Questions or remarks are most welcome and can be posted at the end of the lecture uh, via the chat. My name is Bart Wagenmakers and I'm affiliated to the University of Applied Sciences Utrecht in the Netherlands and I'm an historian specialized in ancient history and with much interest into the history of archaeology. And in the last few years I have done some research uh, into archaeological campaigns in the past and for that reason I'm involved in the Amsterdam Troy project as I will explain later. And the program of the lecture is as follows. It starts with a discussion about how an archaeological campaign organized in the past can be studied in a comprehensive and balanced way. Then this approach will be demonstrated with a case study, the excavation of ancient Jericho, Tel Sultan. And finally, the lecture will zoom in on my uh, contribution to the Troy project. Let's first start analyzing our archaeological campaigns in the past. To understand the archaeological world and the way it has developed into a discipline through the years, it is necessary to have a clear view of archaeological expeditions organized in the past. Aspects such as the expedition objectives, the used approaches and techniques, the processing of the exposed artifacts, the way it was organized, the existing social networks, the living and working conditions on site, etc gives us a state of affairs of the archaeological world at a certain time. But how to study a past archaeological campaign? There are several ways to analyze an excavation to carry out in the past. In my opinion, the campaign should be approached from more than one perspectives, or dimensions as I call them, in order to obtain a comprehensive and balanced view. To be able to discuss the significance of combining different perspectives when analyzing a past excavation, I have attempted to categorize the features into three clear, distinct dimensions. But of course, there's significant overlap between them. The first dimension is the archaeological dimension. It concerns aspects such as the aims of the expeditions, the methods and techniques used on site, the entire processing of artifacts from exposing to restorations, documenting, etc. Secondly, we have the social dimension of the expedition, which involves the documentation of social networks that refer to relations or work relations between people, as well as to people's affiliations to institutions or organizations. The social dimension itself can again be divided into three sections. The organizational section incorporates the formal and informal memberships in organization. The transactional section includes the exchange or transfer of resources, knowledge and connections, such as sponsorships, the fundings, training and log logistical assistance. The last section of the social dimension is a personal one, and the personal category deals with friendships or familial relationships. So we have the archaeological dimension, the social dimension, and the third dimension is the emotional dimension, which, play, uh, which pays a lot of attention to, to excavation life. It describes aspects such as the personal reflection of participants on archaeological activities, the way of life at the dig camp, and the impact of the excavation on the participants' lives. The individual perception is significant for acquiring real insight into the experience, opinions, and reflections present at the expedition. And in order to gain an impression of an archaeological campaign organized in the past, embedded to its historical context, we must examine and define a balanced combination of those dimensions. The quality of the definition depends on the availability and types of sources for each of these three dimensions. On the one hand, we use official publications such as annual field notes, articles, final reports. As the staff of the concerning campaign is responsible for these publications, they do tell us about the aspects the staff wanted to inform the readers. On the other hand, we depend 
on records stored in institutional archives. These records can be divided into published and unpublished ones. Especially the unpublished uh, archival records are interesting, not only because they may add new information to the existing knowledge about the, uh, about the expedition, but also because the staff's decision not to publish those records can provide us insight into the publication policy in those days. The next, now next to the published sources and unpublished archival records, there's a third category called the informal sources. This type of documentation refers to records which do not belong to the official expedition documentation. The formal records can be part of the private documentation of the former participants of the expedition or were made by people who visited the excavation, such as reporters, sponsors, and tourists. For that reason, this category of records are usually not stored in any archive. For several reasons, the informal sources are important for the study of the excavations carried out in the past. First of all, the developments in archaeological recording over the years appear to suggest that there might be a difference between what staff members actually recorded at past excavations and what we today expect them to have documented at the time. As informal documentation has been made on own initiative by the creator and was not instructed by the staff, this type of documentation is able to provide us with new aspects of an excavation which at the time did not seem important to the staff or which the staff were unwilling or deemed not uh, worthy to re record. Now here an example of a picture taken, uh, the left one, in a room at uh, the excavation of Kibet Qumran near the Dead Sea. Um, in the middle there is a pillar just excavated, exposed, and they didn't uh, record or documented the original state of this pillar. They just restored it with plaster. You can see here you see the plaster. So the original height or the original shape of the pillar, the top of the pillar was not uh, visible anymore. When later uh, scholars were studying uh, the situation, they thought it was a pity. They didn't have uh, a good documentation of this original state of the pillar. And decades later, I found uh, at, the, uh, with, uh, at the home of a former participant of this expedition, I think the only original of the photo was made before the restorations. So you can see the original shape. So it gives new information about the excavation in the past. But next to that, it gives us also information about the expedition expeditions recording policy, what to record and what not, and they make decisions. So now we can compare them. And finally, in contrast to the first types of sources, the published sources and unpublished archival sources, which often describe the archeological and social dimension of the excavation, the informal records do not only reinforce those dimension, but they are also able to provide the required data for the emotional dimension. And to conclude for now, for obtaining a comprehensive and balanced view of the past excavation, it is crucial to include all three dimensions, thereby obtaining as many published sources, unpublished archival records, and informal documentation as possible. This point will be demonstrated by a case study on the archaeological campaign to Tel Sultan, ancient Jericho, an expedition I did research on for the last six years. The second British expedition to Tel Sultan was organized from 1952 till 1958 and was directed by Kathleen Kenyon on behalf of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, the University of London and the Palestine Exploration Fund. As usual, the progress of the excavation was recorded by official, officially appointed draftsmen and photographers. The surveyors and excavators recorded the stratigraphy and the finds in the notebooks which were then collected by Kenyon at the end of every season. She used all those official notes, photographs and drawings for her publications of the annual excavation reports, numerous articles, and the final report, Excavations at Jericho. Beside these published sources, many unpublished records can be found in the archives of the Institute of Archaeology of University College London, 
and the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge. In addition, I've collected numerous informal sources by tracing former participants of the excavation or their hairs. The search for informal records has resulted in more than 700 black and white photographs, 52 color slides, 140 letters that describe the archaeological pro uh, progress and camp life in detail, and even one unknown 60 meter millimeter color film, which you can see here. Uh, this film was made by a former biology student. She joined the excavation to Jericho in 1957-1958 and it was the first trip outside the UK. So she bought a 60 millimeter camera and she filmed all the, the journey and also the excavation of Tel Sultan. And this is the only known color film of the excavation. Um, furthermore, nine former participants of this excavation have been interviewed about their time at Tel Sultan, and some of them uh, some of whom were British, American, Canadian, and Palestinians. Thanks to the combination of the published sources, unpublished archival records, and informal documentation, the three dimensions of the expedition to Tel Sultan can be visualized. And for reasons of time, I will just give one example of how fruitful the combination of several kinds of sources and dimensions can be for the study of the history of archaeology. And I will focus on a subject which until recently has hardly been paid attention to, the local workmen. By combining the three dimensions based on as many published sources and published archival records and informal documentation as possible, we are able to get a balanced view of this group of participants that was crucial for the expedition's progress. And it goes without saying that in order to get a realistic view, it is important that the collected data derives from a cross-section of the people involved in excavation. In other words, not just the coordinating staff, but also the field assistants, not just the Western excavators, but also the local laborers themselves. A combined records of the Jericho expedition provide us information about the local people, their relations with other participants, and the way they experienced the excavation. But who were the people who gathered at the gate of the Tel at the beginning of the season, year after year, hoping to be selected by Kathleen Kane as a worker? Several notebooks of the field assistant contain lists with names of local laborers. In addition, expedition photographer Peter Durrell on the right created several categories in his huge color slide collection in the archives including a section with Jericho locals. Thanks to these named lists and slides, the local community who was involved in the excavation is given a face and we have an idea of the size and composition of this group. It is clear that every field season a large number of local laborers was involved in the dig and that the workmen were divided into three categories. First of all, the pigmen who loosened the hard soil with a pickaxe. And you can see standing here, one with a pickaxe. Secondly, the hoe man, standing over here, who scraped the loosened earth together with a hoe and scooped into the baskets. And the third category, the basket man, or more often the basket boy, standing here, uh, who carried away the debris in the basket to the dump. We even have information about the salaries, which seem to be related to these different ranks of pigmen, homen, and basket boy. Informal sources make clear that at the site not much attention was paid to the safety and health circumstances. Sometimes large cracks in the soil on the surface of the slope of the trench, and some of them even 50 meters deep, as you can see here, they were ignored. At least two times, these cracks resulted in collapsing slopes and tons of fallen debris into these trenches. Fortunately, there were no casualties because both times it collapsed overnight, but it had deep impact in, uh, on the laborers. At another time, one of the basket boys was less lucky and fell five and a half meters of the staircase down into his main trench. Due to the repeated participation in the excavation, some laborers developed themselves as a very experienced and skilled workers who were hired by other archaeological expeditions when the field season in Jericho ended. 
these skilled laborers were allowed to help with exposing the facts. You can see it, so you, you can see them busy over here. The contact person, here for example, for the local laborers on the site was a foreman. A local worker who had respect from the workers and would could communicate with the staff in English. The workers were divided into groups of six to eight men and were appointed to a staff member who acted as supervisor of the group. To ensure that the work relation between the supervisors and laborers would run smoothly, the supervisor had to speak some words of Arabic as the laborers usually could not communicate in English. Vocabulary lists with the Arabic translation of English words and short phrases were found on the flap of several notebooks. The voc vocabularies contain a variety of word sets such as, such as numerals, colors, tools like hoe, bag, letter, but also limbs, food products and phrases like what do you want, I don't understand, be careful and hurry up. Apparently, these vocabulary lists were sufficient for communication with the laborers, along with the presence of a foreman of local origin. On the site, there was a clear distinction between staff and the local laborers. While the staff enjoyed their meals in the expedition house prepared by a cook, the laborers brought their own meals from home. The groups of workers in the different areas on the site used to have their meals together. In general, the work working relation between the local laborers and the expedition members was good and expedition members even attend the local weddings and funerals. But the sources also mention tension and incidents, frequently caused by the political turbulent times of the day. Sometimes there were riots caused by anti-Western sentiments that endangered the expedition. Another good example of an incident is when expedition photographer Dennis Corbett had decided to grow a beer because it looked like he had curly side burns. It caused a stir and unrest among the local laborers who constantly shouted Jehudi, Jehudi, Jew against him. But sometimes there was also tension among laborers themselves or between workers who lived in the city of Jericho and those who came from the adjacent Palestinian refugee camp. In order to avoid that the tension would affect the progress of the dig, intolerable behavior was punished. For example, in 1956, Mohammed Ismail and Ahmed Khalil, who was registered for only half a day because of stone throwing. A certain Ghazim and Diab Mohammed received the same punishment for fighting on the site. Despite these examples of frictions, the overall impression of the atmosphere at the site that the sources depict is a friendly one. The excavation could even erase cultural borders. One example, in 1956, Mohammed Adavi, living at the refugee camp in Jericho, worked at excavation for the first time. He was appointed to the team of the Dutch supervisor, Henk Franken, and they got along very well. Franken kept visiting Mohammed when he was excavating in Jordan in the 1960s and 70s. And in fact, Franken became a family friend of Mohammed for the rest of his life. And even after all those decades, Mohammed remembers his time with Franken in Jericho with warm feelings. So my research at Jericho has shown me that combining the three dimension based on published sources and published archival records and informal documentation gives us the opportunity to obtain a comprehensive and balanced view of an excavation in the past. And this approach is also significant for the history of, of archeology span in another way, as I hope to prove with the research visualizing the archaeology of archaeology at Troy. So my work at Jericho was focused on one series of expeditions in the 1950s. However, if a site has been visited by different archaeological expeditions in a long time span, the comparison of the analysis of all those campaigns will provide insight in the development of the archaeological discipline over that period. Troy has been excavated by several expeditions in the last 150 years. So the site is very suitable to study the development of archaeological fieldwork from the 19th century until now. In general, studies of the history of archaeology of a specific site focus mainly on the archaeological key figures, approaches, methods and techniques, 
and base their findings on written sources. In case of the research visualizing the archaeology of archaeology at Troy, I have chosen a different approach by focusing on the, uh, on the changing visual perspective through the ages. The main aim of the research is to study the way changes in the visual documentation of the excavations at Troy relate to the development of archaeology as a discipline in the last 150 years. Instead of following the interpretations made by the archaeologists who excavated at Troy in the past, we let the visual records made during those archaeological campaigns such as slides, photos, films, speak for themselves. By analyzing the role that visual recording played in the archaeological process at Troy, we are able to gain an insight into the development of visual documentation of the archaeological campaigns at Troy, the influence of the site guides on this process, and the impact that the professionalization of the visual recording has had on archaeology as a discipline. As already noted, Archaeological work at Troy began more than a century ago and continues to the present day. This makes this site especially suitable for this goal as we are able to compare different campaigns in a large time span. The excavations can be divided into four groups based on the project directors Heinrich Schliemann, Wilhelm Dirkfeld, Karl Blagen, and Manfred Kaufmann. In order to achieve the project's objective. Three central questions have been formulated. What kind of features did the excavator notice while excavating the site? Which of the features noticed by the excavators um, have been visually recorded and which not? And which of the features visually recorded by the excavators have been published and which not? And to answer these questions, we will use published sources archival records, and hopefully also available in informal documentation. In the first stage of the research, as much visual documentation of the campaign as possible will be collected. Most of the records will come from archives, but also former participants of the Kaufman expedition may have records available. After having collected the visual records, they will be analyzed along a format that has been developed for this research. The format must indicate which features the excavators of a particular expedition selected to be recorded visually. By comparing the results of the several expeditions, we may notice a shifting of recording policy through the years. In this format, one can reckon the archaeological and social dimension. It is hard to determine the emotional dimension based on the experience of the people themselves just on basis of visual records without written or all explanation. So this will not be our focus. Then the visual records will also be compared with the written sources of the expeditions, such as published reports, articles, but also unpublished notebooks and diaries. By comparing the visual records with the written sources, we hope to find out if specific features were not recorded visually and what kind of aspects the stuff published and what not. The data acquired from these analyses, analyses provide us insight in the record, uh, record and the publication policy of the expeditions. Not of next to an impression of the changing recording guidelines at Troy, the research will also set the evolving of recording techniques. At the end of the research, we will conclude whether the notice changes in visual recording at the excavation at Troy corresponds with the general development of the archaeological discipline in the last 150 years. That is the main objective of the Amsterdam Troy project after all. And we have decided to start with the Cincinnati excavation organized from 1932 till 1933, uh, 38, sorry, and directed by Carl Blagan. The collection of the expedition's visual records stored at the archives of the Department of Classics of the University of Cincinnati is extensive and consists of thousands of black and white photos and includes several films as well. Thanks to the dig digital Troy project, the greater part of the records has already been digitized. And I would like to make use of the opportunity to thank the Department of Classics of the University of Cincinnati for their support and sharing the records of the digital Troy project with me. We started this project, this research only recently 
And at this point, I'm not able to present any outcomes at the moment. However, after analyzing the first two photo albums, which means about a thousand photos, selected and annotated by expedition member Marion Rawson, standing here, taking movies uh, on the ladder, I can make some few remarks. It made me not uh, a surprise that the Blake and photo albums include many photos of the archaeological progress and results of the field seasons. But next to the numerous photos of trenches and wall structures, also attention had to be paid, paid to the logistics at the site. For instance, the laying of the railway for transporting the debris with wagons from the excavation to the dump. The photos do also inform us about the tools and instruments the excavators used in the 1930s. You can see the baskets and the barrows. A ladder use for taking soil samples and also different kinds of measuring instruments. Local laborers are present in the photo albums very frequently and sometimes the, cap and the captions of the photos even mention their names. Furthermore, it seems that sometimes two photographers were at work at the same time at the same place, taking almost the same pictures. It's not clear to me now why. And finally, today Troy may be a popular place to visit, but also in the 1930s, tourists knew their way to the site. During the field season of 1936, quote, Hellenistic travelers, end of quote, were visiting the excavation. You can see on the right photos, two tourists enjoying the view. And on the left side, it's maybe hard to see, but in the center of the photo, you see a group of tourists uh, walking across the site. So this lecture aimed to discuss an approach to analyze an excavation in the past in a balanced way and to introduce the visualizing the archaeology of archaeology at Troy research. Hopefully, the results can be presented in another lecture in the future. And I invite you to contact me in case of questions or if you have suggestions, especially suggestions would be welcome. And, um, please use this email address to get in touch with me. And I would like to thank you for your attention. If, you, if there are any questions, you can ask them. And then please make yourself visible and unmute yourself. If there are no questions, I would like to thank you again for attending this lecture. And I wish you a good evening. Thank you.